Hey everyone, welcome back to your favorite sales podcast. I'm your host, Ross Rich, and we have a very special guest today. We have Ryan Lazar, who is the country manager of Canada at Qualtrics, a company you might have heard of, um, taking the world by storm in the CX world. And uh, yeah, appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to join us. Yeah, Ross, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited for the conversation today. Totally. Well, before we get into the meat and potatoes of it, maybe um, go through a bit about your background and how you became you know, the GM of Canada at Qualtrics um, and how you stumbled your way into revenue leadership. Yeah, thank you. Um, so in sales in general, I kind of fell into it, actually. I was uh, graduated uh, from university as a civil engineer, started doing that. Um, the company actually that I worked for went bankrupt in 2008 during the the recession that happened there. And like I said, fell into sales. Sales was really the only jobs hiring. So uh, started my career at Xerox, banging on doors, old school. It was uh, it was fun. It was painful, uh, and it was something that I just said, "Hey, listen, I, I I need to get out. This is this is difficult." Um, but but it truly taught me like the grit of what it's like to to work hard, to just persevere, and just be resilient in sales. So. Had a couple jobs after that, um, worked uh, for seven years as country manager for uh, Career Builder, so a talent acquisition mm -hmm. organization based out of the US. And then a friend at Career Builder actually brought me over to, uh, to Qualtrics. Uh, we had worked together there and the opportunity just seemed too good to pass up. The, you know, the interview process, it was really starting the Canadian business. So I've been here at Qualtrics now for six years. Uh, when I started, there was less than three of us. And wow. in six years, we've we've significantly expanded our, our customer base. When when I started, there was like sub 200. We're upwards of a thousand now. People, as I said, was less than three. And we're close to about 30, 35. So uh, continuing to expand, continuing to grow. And what we help organizations with customer and employee experience, it's adapting rapidly and just growing with every single organization we're talking to. So it's been, uh, it's, it's been fun and, and we're just getting started too. So what was the, I mean, you, you usually hear people, you know, not necessarily growing up and thinking that they're going to be a sales leader when they're, you know, five or seven years old, but going from engineering to sales, what was that transition? Like, it feels like that's kind of two ends of completely, you know, ends of the spectrum. Ross, if my dad had a say, he said, or my dad did have a say, he said, do not go into sales. Um, <laughs> not young. And, and my, you know, I come from very humble upbringings. Like my mom uh, worked for, for the city of Windsor. Uh, my dad was a school teacher, uh, incredible people, great, great parents, mm -hmm. and, but not sales at all. And so like we were, you know, I was, I was always kind of like the, you know, is this, is this really our kid? Like he acts very different. Like, <laughs> Like, you know, just, um, you know, he's, he's highly motivated. And so anyway, I think um, just a very like risk adverse family I grew up in. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, he said, you know, you should, you should go, you're good at math. You should become an engineer. Um, they make good money and, you know, and, and, and kind of gave me that very secure job, stable stuff like that. Right. And so anyway, so. I started that. That's the path I went down. That's the path that I studied in university. And honestly, I felt I, I totally fell into it. As I said, I lost my job. Company went bankrupt in 2008. One of my friends from back home in Windsor area, um, he actually called me and he said, listen, um, you know, I, I, I've known you your entire life. He was in sales. He was a few years older than me. And he was in sales. And he said, listen, you're not an engineer, man. I'm just going <laughs> to flat out. Um, you need to get into sales. I've been in sales for a number of years. I've known you forever. I just think you would be really good at it. Um, and so anyway, that's, that's kind of how it all started. And, you know, I've, I've had some incredible leaders, mentors, and, and teammates along the way that have just, you know, made it, made it fun for what I've been doing. That's awesome. Yeah. It's kind of interesting to hear, like you had your path you went to school for, which is not an easy degree, especially compared to the liberal arts stuff that uh, most sellers do, like I did myself before. And, you know, uh, that's, that seems like kind of the hardest part. And then, you know, maybe smoother sailing from there. Um, yeah, with 08 and, you know, stumbling into Xerox, which I just continue to hear amazing, amazing things about their enablement and training program to really kind of go back to school and learn how the, you know, kind of profession is handled. 
Yeah. Yeah. It was, it, it was, it was a total change, but like, obviously, listen, I'm glad I did it. Um, and, and it, it did feel a little more natural than sitting behind a desk. And I think an element of that too, like I was, you know, growing up, putting myself through school. Um, I was, I was in the, uh, like hospitality, uh, scene. Mm -hmm. So bartended for quite a while, like almost 10 years. And I did that actually, like when I first started in sales too, it kind of helped me, um, fund the money that I wasn't making in sales early, early on. Um, yeah. To try to, you know, sustain a, a healthy living up here in Toronto, which was expensive. Um, but in oh. that, you know, you had to constantly talk to people that that you'd met for the first time, right? You had to interact with people and just be social. And so I think that was another element that kind of helped propel me into sales as well. And on top of that, you know, you typically were paid based on how hard you worked. And so some of the places that I worked at were like high volume pubs. And the harder you worked, the more drinks you poured, the more money you made. And so going into engineering, it was, okay, well, you're making the same paycheck every single, you know, every single month. And um, I like the fact that I could control my destiny if I worked harder. Totally. Yeah. And I think the, a lot of, yeah, salary kind of competitive with themselves in that way, right? Um, mm -hmm. Want to do better and do better. But uh, before we shift gears into kind of the three key strategies for execution exits we're going to talk about from your journey and now leading, you know, Canada for Qualtrics. What do you find the most challenging part of running a revenue organization? Yeah, so I think there's there's a couple things. Um, you know, I you break it out internally and externally, right? So yeah. what, what are the challenges internally that you need to go through, and then um, and then with customers and so forth. So internally, if we break it down, it's you know being the later leader of a Canadian business, U.S. U.S. run firm. This is my second go at it. And I think one of the one of the biggest areas where where I constantly need to reinforce with senior leadership is just the differences in our market, like whether, whether it's the GDP, whether it's the productivity per employee, the currency exchange, different scenarios, understanding mm -hmm. what our cam is in the market here. So that just helps me build the proper quotas and expectations, I would say, for the Canadian yeah. market. Um, which, you know, again, for the team that's here gives them more confidence that, you know, they, they have the right opportunity to succeed. So, um, managing up senior leadership, that's one thing. Uh, also just working with other departments. I was once told by, uh, by an incredible mentor that, you know, uh, the most difficult part of your job, you need to sell harder internally than you do externally. And, and that's <laughs> very with, true. Very true. It, it is so true, right? Like, you know, this as well, coming from large organizations. Um, they, one, like they they don't always move as fast as you do too. So it's like, mm -hmm. it's a matter of like holding them accountable. And one of the things that I always say too, is like, you know, if you're calling somebody, are they, are they smiling when you call? And are they excited to pick up the phone internally? <laughs> Or are they just like rate rate to delete, right? I mean, so like building a good reputation internally um, is so critical, and just being a good human in person, like to work with you know work with the internal law uh, teams. So I think like those are some of the obstacles internally. When it goes to external, um, you know, we're we're seeing a lot of organizations that are just comfortable, and so getting them to change to something new uh, is is becoming more difficult, especially in yep. the times that we're in. And so that change management piece is is absolutely like one of one of the one of the toughest barriers to overcome. And I think the the key elements that we're we're kind of incorporating into our selling motion just to make sure we can overcome this is, having building the trust right away, making sure that like we we are offering the best solution, right? And there is value, like we're showing an ROI or what that should look like over the uh, over the duration of the partnership. And that comes from the partnership up front with the individual we're talking to. And um, you know, th those are some of the key areas. And then I would also say from a partnership standpoint, you know, we leverage hundreds of partners in our ecosystem to do the implementation and advisory of our of our software. And so working closely with them, coming into the conversations together with the customer, having a very clear roadmap and plan to success is is very critical. So I think that's something that, you know, we're continuing to evolve and avoid, but getting organizations out of the 
I'm good. Like, I'm just going to stay status quo to, okay, I need to change. And this is why that's, that's been the biggest challenge. Yeah. I mean, like you mentioned in this market, no one wants to be the person that's taking that big risk and, Hey, we should, we should make an investment proactively and spend the money. I mean, especially in Canada, you talked about the differences between the U S and Canada. I think um, I heard this great quote from a mentor of mine um, who said, um, Canadians will make buying decisions when it can save them money. Americans are willing to make investments when it will make them more money. And I think that's really challenging when you have a product like yours that, you know, yes, it can help you save money, but you're improving like long-term customer satisfaction experience and all this great stuff that isn't just tomorrow we're going to cut costs. So yeah, yeah, helping people take that risk and and make that leap is definitely really challenging. You're, you know, you're absolutely right. And um, it's a great point you bring up too, right? Like we, you need to show the value. And I feel like it's even, it, you know, I see some of my peers in the US, I do feel like it's probably a little more difficult to get them over the edge here. Um, like healthcare, for example, hospitals here, as you know, are uh, publicly funded, right? Versus private in the US. So totally different, right? In our healthcare system, we want, I mean, we don't want people hanging around in the hospital for a long time, right? That, that <laughs> In and out, yeah. <laughs> Right. Whereas in the U.S., I mean, there's, you know, there's obviously fees that are associated with that. So it's it's a totally different mindset. Um, you know, we've developed a great program with the Ontario Hospital Association, uh, and we're now powering uh, 100 patient experience programs across the hospitals here in Ontario. So that was a, a multi-year journey that we were on with them. And mm-hmm. the results that we're seeing now are incredible. Like we're we're seeing almost a 20x increase in response rate to what they were doing prior to us joining. So the results are there. People, you know, want to leave feedback. And now the next uh, evolution of that is like, okay, now what's the action that we're going to take? How do we empower the right people? Mm -hmm. Totally. Well, that's awesome to hear that uh, when they do make their decisions, that uh, they get some value. But yeah, it's hard to hard to make those leaps, especially when yeah, no one wants to get fired these days for making a big bet uh, and working with another company. But uh, shifting gears from kind of your path and learnings from revenue leadership to some actual strategies we're going to talk about around driving execution excellence. We've got three topics we're going to dig into um, that you shared. We're going to talk about building community, both internally and externally. We're going to talk about consistency and clarity. No, no fire drills. I like that. Uh, uh, branding and then radical candor, which I'm excited to get your take on. Cause yeah, sharing, sharing feedback, uh, that isn't always positive. is definitely challenging, but rewarding for everyone. So uh, I'm excited to dig into that piece, but where should we start out of those three? Yeah, let's start at the top. I think building the community, awesome. right. Um, internally and externally. And we, you know, we, we just talked about this too. I think it's, it is so critical for, for everybody to, to build a community, right? And, and to build their brand, I would say, right? To just be out mm-hmm. there. And I always talk to my team about this too, on how important it is to be out in the market, right? Um, represent your brand, represent yourself, right? And that could be being out like, you know, now that live sessions are happening a lot more frequently, like get out there, go meet people, shake hands, do that. But also yeah. um, on LinkedIn, right? Social media, just be vocal, be relevant where you can. Um, yeah. And, and that, that's on the external piece, right? So I think the more you can be seen as a resource for what you do in your industry, the more yes. people are going to come to you. I always like to, there's a great book, actually, it's called Super Connectors. And there's a lot you could take away from that. It, it talks about just really like one, always being there to help someone. So a question that you, you know, that you would ask after just having a coffee with someone is like, what can I do to help you, right? And always be willing to, to help um, always be willing to make connections. Uh, mm-hmm. and so I, I feel throughout my career, I've kind of always been able to connect, you know, Ross, you should go meet this person from company X, Y, Z, cause they were looking, you know, at, uh, at a solution that, um, that's similar to yours, something like that or network or whatever it may be. So externally, um, making sure you're out, making sure you're building and growing those connections and um, I mean, th- those are really like the main things internally. It's uh, it's making sure that like, you know, you have a sense of or you're building a team where everyone's rowing in the same direction. Right. <clears throat> and that's that's difficult, especially if if you're if you're building a team, you know, you can kind of build it from scratch and you can kind of watch it grow and direct things. If you're yeah. inher- if you're inheriting some team members building a bit, that's where it becomes 
a little trickier and where I've, I've experienced that in my career too. Uh, and, and you just kind of have to get everyone bought into the same vision, same direction. And that's what's like so, so critical. Because once you do that, it's something so special. And I would say a part of that too is like, you know, again, the background at career builder talent acquisition is like hiring. And I'm always, always talking to good people. Like if, even if we don't have an open role, I have a list of people that I've talked to over the last two years where, mm -hmm. you know, it's like green or red, right? Would I hire this person? Would I not um, for this particular role? And so when the role does become open, I'm ready to quickly backfill that with an individual that we've already vetted. And we go through a whole interview process, but I think it's a matter of like that next hire needs to level up the rest of your team, not level them down. And so you totally. know, those, those are a couple of things I think about when you're building a community, how it's critical on both the internal and external side. And on the external front, I mean, I think a lot of people in sales, I mean, I, this was me, like, in my career, I didn't start to to really be vocal externally and be involved in the community until I started a court and felt like that was my job. How do you help sellers realize the value? Because now I'm like, wow, like this stuff works. It, it is very powerful to be out there, to have a name, to be connecting people on stuff because so few people do it. But how do you kind of build that culture around it and people that might not be comfortable and maybe they have 20 years, 15 years of sales experience and haven't seen the benefit or tried that? How do you think about kind of rallying a team around um, get into that aha moment, but being part of that external community. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, listen, you, you've taken it to the next level, right? Like you've now started your own company. You have developed your own podcast. You have great following on LinkedIn. You are out there in social, like in networking events. Right. And so it's a couple things, right? Because like, as an owner of your own company, obviously you have to probably double it down. It feels like my job there. But I could have been way more successful as a seller in the career before founding a company if I had done that stuff. So I'm curious, like, how have you helped coach and help people realize the value and maybe they don't feel like they have to as part of their yeah. job? Yeah. And so <clears throat> it's one, you have to lead by example. So mm -hmm. like, you know, yourself as as the leader of Accord, uh, myself as the leader of the Canadian business, I cannot stay behind a curtain and, yeah. you know, not be out there. Like I, I need to be out in the market. I need to be at these events. I need to be out in front of customers. Like, and so leading by example is first and foremost thing you need to do. Now, the difference is, you know, I would say since, since COVID is you have to be a bit more intentional about it. Um, yeah. Face-to-face meetings aren't just going to come as naturally as they once did, right? They're getting better. Obviously we know that, but you have to be like very intentional. So like set OKR, like set quarterly objectives to say, I need, which I have, I need to be at X number, uh, like out with, uh, with like out in the market 20 times a quarter. I need to be mm. meeting with 20 senior leaders every single quarter, like be very intentional about it and set objectives uh, around doing that. Yeah, no, that's, that's interesting. That's kind of what we were talking about, even at a court, we're like, how do we set goals? We know this is so important, but it's not just going to happen, right? And even yeah. if we know, hey, the headquarters of this company is in Austin, well, their ops person might be in Seattle, and their, you know, CS leader might be in New York, and this and that, it's so much harder to get a group of people together. And you almost need to go on these trips just to meet, like a single person versus a whole company, right? Before it was like, I could shake 12 hands and meet everyone else involved in this decision or even, you know, folks outside of it. And now it's like much more challenging to, um, to create those opportunities to get lucky. Right. Mm -hmm. Totally. You know, you're absolutely right. And that's, you know, and that's where you fall into the trap of like, you know, it's just easier to, it's easier to just do a zoom, but it's in those scenarios, you know, when are there, when are there company events? Like when does everyone get together? Right. Know when they are getting together with their peers yeah. and build around that. And maybe just yes. say, hey, we'd love to host you all for a dinner or a game or something like make it something for them. We're investing resources. We'd love to do a workshop that day. Maybe make it part of the QBR that you're hosting, right? Something like that. So it's like meeting people where they are and making it easier for them. Mm. I love that idea. Yeah. We, uh, speaking of which, we crashed one of our customers user events the other week in New York and we're able to meet a ton of people. Like you're saying, like 
don't make it about you. You can show up to where they're already doing this stuff. That's a, that's a great takeaway there in terms of how do you get involved in, in the community. But shifting gears to the last couple of points, we've got consistency and clarity and radical candor. Maybe let's start with, yeah, what, is, what does that mean to you? No fire drills. How do you drive consistency and clarity across your, your organization? Yeah, I, you know, honestly, I'm, uh, I think this kind of goes to a lot. You, you talked about like the engineering to sales and, you know, how, how different of a career it is. Right. And I, and I feel that this is where the engineering part comes in handy is having a very like pro like being very process driven and disciplined and organized and things like that. Like, mm-hmm. um, for myself personally, like if I'm, if I'm not organized, right. Leading a team then my, you know, I'm just, I'm not going to be there for my team. And, and I just, you know, I'm not going to be able to support them the way that they need to be supported. Right. And so it's even more critical for me to be next level organized. Um, The consistency piece is making sure and clarity, I guess we'll go with it as well. At the same time is like being very clear of like, what, where I can help things that I need to do my job as well too. If, um, if we're working on a deal or something like that, like it's, you know, like here's kind of the format, um, for us to review together. And it's the same every single time, right? We recently, uh, so, so like whenever we have a deal review, it's just, they know exactly what needs to go into that doc. We have a weekly pipeline forecast meeting on Wednesday it's like, these are the things to fill out, fill them out on Tuesday by close of business. Cause I'll review it Tuesday night. So that when I'm mm-hmm. going to meetings with them on Wednesdays, I've already kind of gone through it and I have a bunch of questions listed so we could just be more efficient with our time. So I'm just, I'm, I'm very mindful of like time and being intentional about like, you know, uh, let's maximize everyone's time. So I've, I've, I'm sure you've had this too, where you've had leaders in the past and you've gotten like a request on Saturday morning. It doesn't happen as much anymore, thank God. But, you know, back when I started my career, Saturday morning, you get a request and something needs to be done by Sunday, uh, end of day. And it's like, this is the weekend, like, you know, like, and so um, anyway, I'm trying to, by having consistency, by having clarity, by knowing what you need to know and getting the information, mm-hmm. I say no fire drills. It is rare that my team has a fire drill because I typically have all the information that I know I need. If a scenario like that comes up or one of the executives reach, reaches out and says, Ryan, hey, we need this insight. I don't need to reach out to anyone. I already have it. So. Yeah, and take it sounds like you're trying to take that on yourself instead of across the team. And also another phrase that I keep hearing lately in 2024 from leaders is understanding what great looks like. Like if you're clear and you set great ex- expectations around this is what I expect from you, it makes it a lot easier for them to do their job, right? And for you to as well. It sounds like you spent a lot of time helping the team understand like this is what excellence looks like on our team. Um, where I think that's a mystery for a lot of uh for a lot of uh, sellers or managers, when their leaders ask them for something, it's like, what does he really mean by this? Yeah, yeah, to- well, totally, right? So it's like, if you're always asking the consent, like if it's just very consistent, it's it's clean. And like, listen, I don't mind taking the calls on sat- Saturday and like getting those requests and stuff. Like, you know, it is what it is. I'd say it's part of the job, but um, I don't want my team to to have that. And so I yeah. try to I try to be that umbrella for them on scenarios like that. Totally. Well, shifting gears to the last piece, radical candor, something I think a lot of people talk about doing. I find this the hardest part of leadership and, and building teams, right? Is um, you know, for the for the, the overall positivity of the culture, delivering, you know, uh direct feedback. Curious to hear how that's kind of how you think about that and how you built a culture of, of radical candor at, at Paltrix. Yeah. So I actually did a podcast on specifically this topic and we can go deep on this. I'll keep it high level though, Um, because it is a philosophy that we've, you know, it's been really um, built into our system at Qualtrics. So Kim Scott, founder of Radical Candor, um, she, well, her and Russ Laraway and Russ, actually a good friend of mine. um, He, he like helped run this training throughout Qualtrics. Right. And so he Mm -hmm. embedded it to, into that leadership mentality and, you know, the philosophy in very sh- simple is care personally, challenge directly. And I would say easier, easier said than done. Right. But 
what this means is generally like just being being able to give feedback, being able to receive feedback, re receive feedback, but doing so in a way where you care, like you do care about the person. You care about their growth. You care about the development, right? There's there's nothing worse than not getting any feedback from your leader, right? I mean, we're we we all um, we all want to grow. We all want to get better. And so, you know, typically, if I'm on a call with um, with someone on my team, like we'll chat after for a few minutes and just say, hey, listen, did this great? Like maybe work on a couple of these areas, but overall, mm -hmm. like you know, this is this is kind of the what I felt about the call. So I just it's it's something where you know like listen the space we're in we're in customer and employee experience right experience management so like feedback is part of our nature and so yeah. it might be a little over rotated for us but <laughs> but giving receiving feedback i'll say this um i would i have grown as a leader tremendously uh since since being at qualtrics because of the feedback that we you know go back and forth with that's awesome. Yeah, I feel like um, sometimes kindness in the long term is harmful. Like I felt like this at, honestly, at Stripe, we had this big challenge around everyone was really nice, blah, blah, blah. It was like a great work. But then it kind of went to the extreme where people didn't have space. It felt it felt off culture to mm -hmm. share very direct feedback because mm -hmm. everyone was so kind of gentle and kind about stuff and the way we communicated. So um, yeah, it's really interesting when you see kind of how that can change the, the culture. Totally. Yeah, we, we, we've seen it. And honestly, it's like, it's expected. And, and quite honestly, like I, I asked for feedback for my team too. Okay. I've done better. Right. Totally. So, well, before we wrap, we got a few more minutes. Um, uh, we have time to hit some rapid fire questions, Ryan. I'm going to ask you for either one word or one sentence answers to about five questions. Are you ready? Yes, let's do it. Let's do it, man. Main reason teams miss their AR targets. That is cool. Yeah. Uh, favorite resource related to revenue leadership could be a book, a course, a podcast that you listen to. Uh, hmm, that's a good one. Um, I think book. book I, I read quite a bit, so book. Awesome. Anyone in particular jump out, jump to mind? You know, one, one of my favorite, like the challenger customer, Matt Dixon, I know actually well too. And he, uh, he wrote that, that was like the first one that kind of got things going. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, like extreme ownership is a great book. I talked about super connectors. Yes, that's a couple, great one. Like, yeah. So there's a couple, a lot of mine have been like more like leadership focused and they all come with different principles. So I always take like little tidbits, Kobe, uh, Mamba mentality. I read, uh, when I was away a couple of weeks ago, that was a good one too. But uh, I'm a basketball fan, so I enjoyed it for many reasons. Totally, totally. It's a great one. Um, what do you think the number one challenge for revenue leaders is in 2024? Outside of status quo. Yeah, yeah. Right differentiation. Now. I would say like, yeah, just mm. being, being different than your competition. Yeah. Um, most important organization in the revenue team, sales, CS, or marketing? Oh man, that is, you are setting me <laughs> up here. Oh, can I pass on that? I think I think oh, you gotta I, say one. You gotta say one. I think every organ <laughs> every organization or every department in an organization is valuable no matter what. All right. They all have their Okay, they, okay. Very diplomatic of you, Ryan. They they all <laughs> they all have their value. You're gonna get me in trouble with some people here. <laughs> <laughs> okay well last one before you get in trouble what's your favorite way to unplug the demands of leadership uh so i i, I run every morning so i just uh i like getting away and it kind of just I have a running group uh with guys on my street and we just go for runs it's fun amazing yeah that's definitely the best way to, to start an intense day be in the right mindset and feel good mentally physically spiritually awesome man. well thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule um, to share some of your hard-earned lessons from uh, your career at uh, Career Builders, now Qualtrics. And uh, yeah, I know I took a lot out of it. So hopefully folks listening in uh, have some notes for themselves as well. Really appreciate this, Ross. This was a great conversation. Thanks so much.